All right, let's take our hymn books and turn to hymn number 475. We begin our time of worship, 475. Redeemed, our love to proclaim, redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Redeemed, how I love to proclaim it. Redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Redeemed through his infinite mercy. His child and forever I am. Redeemed, redeemed, redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Redeemed, redeemed. His child and forever I am. Redeemed and so happy in Jesus, no language my rapture can tell. I know that the light of his presence with me doth continually dwell. Redeemed, redeemed, redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Redeemed, Redeemed, his child and forever I am. I think of my blessed Redeemer. I think of him all the day long. I sing for I cannot be silent. His love is the theme of my song. Redeemed, redeemed, redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Redeemed, redeemed, his child and forever I am. I know I shall see in his beauty the king in whose law I delight, who lovingly guardeth my footsteps and giveth me songs in the night. Redeemed, redeemed. Redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Redeemed, redeemed, his child and forever I am. Let's take our Bibles and for our scripture reading, turn together to Psalm 95. In this psalm, we have the elements of true worship. How it is that we come before the Lord. And the first thing we see here is that all true worship is unto the Lord. It's not about being with your friends and acquaintances or impressing one another with our times of worship, but unto the Lord. And so we have here a command, oh come. I said, come unto me, all you that labor. Every day, and I'll give you rest. Let us sing unto the Lord, capital L O R D, as Jehovah God, Father, Son, and Spirit. And let us make a joyful noise, notice to the rock of our salvation. Make a joyful noise, that is the noise of victory. When an army would defeat an enemy, there would be a loud noise that would go up. Really, that's what we're celebrating, even here, for looking to the death of the Lord Jesus Christ. And that victory over sin, over Satan, over hell, over the world, that he would accomplish for his people. Him being the rock of our salvation. There is no other rock. There's no other salvation. But in by and through the Lord Jesus Christ. So, all true worship is unto the Lord. But secondly... We see here in verse 2 that it is with thanksgiving. True worship is not a duty. It's not something that we're obligated, required to do at all costs. No, but it's with thanksgiving. Let us come before his presence. In the Old Testament, the only way to come before the presence of God was through the high priest entering into that holiest of holies, once a year, and yet not without blood. So to come before his presence, he's a holy God. How do you do that? With thanksgiving. Well, with thanksgiving for the great high priest that God has appointed for sinners. We don't come 
individually and personally in and out. We come through our high priest, but with thanksgiving that because of his great work, because of what Christ has accomplished, we can come and again, make a joyful noise unto him with psalms. I believe that if we truly are taught of the Lord, it is with persuasion that we sing unto the Lord. And notice, not just anything, but make a joyful noise unto him with psalms. These psalms are written, the psalms and spiritual songs. We're singing back to God what he has been pleased to reveal already of himself to us. We're not trying to come up with contemporary music. Just like our Lord, when he came to this earth, would have fulfilled every one of these psalms that we're reading here in scripture. And so it's with thanksgiving, giving thanks to God for who he is as a sovereign God, a holy God, a just God, yet being merciful to such sinners as we are through his son. And then thirdly, to worship him is really to exalt every attribute of God as the king. Notice, for the Lord is a great God. As if to say, Lord, we're not enough. Now the explanation, a great God. A God above any other God that could be imagined. Men have many gods that they imagine. That's what an idol is. It's an idea. But he is the great God. And notice, a great king above all God. No, there's no God but him. And yet in men's minds, they are idolaters. We are. We create our view of God as we think he is. And men love their view of God. But here's one who is the God. And notice how he's exalted here in these verses. He's the God of creation. It says, in his hand are the deep places of the earth. The strength of the hills is his also. Think about the mountains and think about how deep, if you were taken to drill all the way down, what's all under there, the minerals and everything that's hidden from view as far as man. But even there, nobody has been able to completely plummet the depths even of this earth, that's what it's talking about, the deep places of the earth to discover what's there. A few years ago in this area of Shreveport, the Haynesville Shale, people were finding, drilling down, finding oil 12,000 feet down, where back in the day, most of the equipment they had was for two or 3,000 feet. And all of a sudden, men begin to prosper because they found this shale, and now everybody's scurrying, trying to figure out the best mechanics to be able to get down that far. And yet, I dare say there's probably more things that are 30, 40,000 feet under that have never discovered. But God put it there. He's the creator. And not only the deep things of the earth, but you see in, in verse 5, the sea is his. We've not even begun to scratch the surface as far as what's under the earth, but then think about the depths of the sea. And he made it. I love that. Stand on the ocean, just look at that vast body of water. And to think that it's the majority of this earth is, is water. What's keeping those waters from flooding and just completely overflowing the continents? Well, it's his hand. Same hand that created the deep depths of the earth. The sea is his and he made it and his hands formed the dry land. He's the one that determines what's sea and what's dry land. Even today, there's all kinds of ways that people are trying to figure out how not to, how to stop the erosion because the sea comes in and takes out land. People that have built their nice little houses right along the seafront are suddenly finding that those houses are crashing into the sea. Who determines all of that but the Lord? So he's the God of creation. But secondly, we see here in verse 6, he's the God of providence. He says, oh, come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our maker. That means that He's created us and he directs all things. 
And how we worship him is to bow down to him and glorify him in his providence. And however he's purposed to use any one of us to his honor and glory. And then thirdly, he is the God, the king in salvation. Notice verse 7, for he is our God. Men have their gods, but he, this God, sovereign, holy, just, one who saves according to his will, saves by his son, whom he will, he is our God. Never had anybody tell you, well, that's not my God. Well, obviously he's not, but he's, he's our God. Many times if you're questioning, well, how do you speak to people who don't know God in truth? You just say that. Let me tell you how God's been pleased to teach me. Let me tell you about my God. He is our God. And we are the people of his pasture. That already defines us as who we are as his people. If we're his, it says they're the sheep of his hand. The sheep has not anything to do with being a sheep. It's God that has so made them in us. The difference between a sheep and a goat, it's God that made the difference. Today, he says, if you will hear his voice, harden not your heart as in the day of provocation, as in the day of the temptation of the wilderness. So here he's addressing it specifically to these who are his sheep. Those who are his sheep, even though they're born with a hardened heart, yet they do not remain in that hardened state when they hear his voice. For I said, my sheep hear my voice and they follow me. So if you want to know the difference between a sheep and a goat, just look at how a sinner responds to the message of God in Christ and his sovereign grace and salvation in him. If that heart is hardened and a person is left in that state, then that's a pretty good indication that they weren't sheep anyway. Christ isn't standing there begging sinners to become his sheep. He knows his sheep and he calls them, but all others, just like their fathers, he says in verse 9, when your fathers tempted me, proved me and saw my work. They saw all that the elect saw. They saw all that Joshua and Caleb saw. That's what it's talking about in the wilderness there in Numbers 14 when they refused to enter in. People think that it's by democracy or by a majority vote. Well, they took a majority vote back there in in Israel and guess what they lost the majority was wrong truth is never in the majority but those that are the Lord's they are distinguished by that bowing to God as he is as opposed to all others and that's why verse 10 says 40 years long was I grieved with this generation and said it is a people that do err in their heart Notice, they have not known my ways. If God leaves sinners to their own way, like people want. They say, well, I think God ought to leave this matter up to us and to our supposed free will. Well, guess what? You just desire condemnation. Just look at the history of Israel. On the boom, verse 11, the Lord says, I swear in my wrath that they should not enter into my rest. The rest there was pictured as the promised land in the Old Testament, but in the New Testament, we know that Christ is our rest. So when God gives men up to their own reprobate minds, it is actually God swearing in his wrath. It's a determination by God. You'll never enter in. It's the only way that any enter in is going to be through Christ who is our rest. That's how we worship. This is the God that we worship by his grace. Gracious Father, thank you for your word. I pray that as we come before you, even now, it is with that spirit of worship that only your spirit does give, that we might know you in truth and know our need to be represented by your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And apart from him, there is no salvation. Oh, what a great God you are. So enable us to worship you. Enable us to bow down and to worship you not only as the God of creation and providence, but of salvation. And that if 
we do enter in to that rest which your son has accomplished. It's only by your grace. So we're deserving of nothing but your wrath. So let this be a time of worship and thanksgiving as we consider all that you are to us as sinners because of your son, the Lord Jesus Christ. It's in his precious name. Let's sing hymn number 17 in our hymn books, and then we'll get right to the message. Hymn number 17, Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing, to my heart to sing thy grace. Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing, to my heart to sing thy grace. Streams of mercy never ceasing, Call for songs of loudest praise. Teach me some melodious sonnet, sung by flaming tongues of love. Praise the mount I'm fixed upon it, mount of my redeeming love. Here I raise my Ebenezer, Hither by thy help I'm come, and I hope by thy good pleasure safely to arrive at home. Jesus sought me when a stranger, wandering from the fold of God, he to rescue me from danger, Interposed his precious blood. Oh, to grace, how great a debtor daily I'm constrained to be. Let thy goodness, like a fetter, bind my wandering heart to thee. From to wander, Lord, I feel it. From to leave the God I know, here's my heart, oh, take and seal it, seal it for thy courts above. I'd like to invite you to look with me in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, and verse 18. We're going to take a little detour this week, and then next week, Lord willing, we'll go back to our study in 1 Kings. Here in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 18, I want to speak with you about giving thanks unto God. The scriptures have a lot to say about thanksgiving. In fact, someone took the time to go through the scriptures and came up with 138 different passages of scripture that deal with thanksgiving thankfulness unto God. And just like we read here in Psalm 95, that's how we come before the Lord, with thanksgiving. We don't cower down as in fear, being fearful of being accepted. If you're accepted in the beloved or in the beloved one, that is the Lord Jesus Christ, then therein is our acceptance. And that's how come before him. So here in 1 Thessalonians 5, all of this is drawn out of that foundation, what it is to be saved. I know that word is thrown around today. People ask you, when did you get saved? And what they mean is, at what point did you make a decision for Jesus? That's not salvation. It's not me embracing him. It's him having embraced me from all eternity. It's not how I love him, but how he has loved me. And it's not what I sacrifice for him, but rather what he sacrificed for me. That is my salvation. This is by God's appointment. If you go all the way back to verse 9 of 1 Thessalonians 5, notice, for God hath not appointed us to wrath. Just read about in Psalm 95 those whom God has said in his wrath that they shall not enter in. See, right here is a point where most people that profess to know God have a problem because 
they think that God loves everybody and really doesn't want to send anybody to hell. But alas, if he has to, he will. That's not how the scriptures describe God. There is a clear appointing of sinners to salvation. And there is a definite appointing of sinners to wrath. And if you have a problem with that, you have a problem with God. Here it says the contrast for those that are his, the God of salvation, is that he had not appointed us to wrath. The conclusion is there are those that he has appointed to wrath, but not those that he's purposed to save in Christ Jesus. And that's what the second part of the verse says. Notice, to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ. It doesn't say merit that salvation, but obtain it. And if you look in the epistle to the Hebrews, that salvation was obtained by the redemption. That's where those that are saved were saved. Salvation was purposed from eternity, but the actual accomplishing of salvation occurred at the cross when Christ finished the work. I love to tell people that. And they ask me, when were you saved? Well, it was over 2,000 years ago. Well, no, that's, no, if, if that's not where you see your salvation, then you've never been taught of the Lord. To obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ. And notice how definitive it is. It doesn't talk about any kind of cooperation by the Lord Jesus Christ and by you agreeing to it. No, it was obtained when he died. So that's the salvation appointed. And it says, who died for us. I love this, that whether we wake or sleep, nothing we do affects this salvation. We should live together with him. We live together with him in his resurrection when he rose on high, and we'll live together with him forever in his presence because of that work accomplished. And he says here in verse 11, wherefore comfort yourselves together. And edify one another, even as also ye do. This is what's characteristic of those that the Lord draws together by his grace. There's a comforting of one another and an edifying, a building up of one another. We can rest. That's the picture of rest there because of the work of Christ. But he says here in verse 12, because we're sinners, we need to be reminded of these things. He said, we beseech you, brethren, to know them which labor among you. He's talking about those that the Lord has raised up to minister Christ among them. And I love that word, among you. So years ago, the Lord convinced me to stop saying I'm going to preach to you. I'm not preaching to you. I'm not preaching at you. I'm preaching for you. This is a privilege to be here and to declare unto you, being one among you, laboring among you, not above you, the things of Christ, and exactly how it is that God has been pleased to teach my heart. That's what a witness is, isn't it? You don't have to put words in a witness's mouth. The things we've seen and heard, that's taught by the Spirit of God. These things I declare unto you, but I am among you. But then it says, and are over you, but in the Lord. And admonish you. It's only over you in the sense of position or office, in that this is a work that the Lord has put in the hands of such as I am, as an under shepherd, for the purpose of admonishing. It's not scolding, and that's not whipping with a ten prong whip, but admonishing, exhorting. And it says, and to esteem them very highly in love for their work's sake. Now, this isn't talking about anybody that claims to be a preacher, but this is talking about one that the Lord has raised up among his sheep, and they're to be highly esteemed, not revered. None of these take that title, reverend, but highly esteemed. Notice, in love. Those that are fed the word of Christ by his under shepherds, the sheep love them. I liken it to my pets. You know, they, they could have spent the whole day penned up, but as soon as you walk through the door, their old tails wagging, 
my cat comes and sits there and starts brushing up next to me, there's a re reciprocal love because of how I love them and treat them. That's just a small picture here of those that the Lord has placed among his sheep to teach them and point them to Christ. That's why I say it's not any preacher. I know there are preachers that demand respect. They demand that people follow them. No. In love, that's a key word. Because of the love of Christ, those that are sheep are drawn to them. And I'll tell you, if a preacher isn't pointing them to Christ, those sheep are going to flee. Because Christ said, a stranger they will not leave. And be at peace among yourselves. There's no reason to be unsettled when you think about it. There should be no reason for business meetings. You realize every time we meet, we're having a business meeting. We're about the Father's business. I have people ask me that. Too. When do you have your business meeting? Every time we meet for worship. No, you know what I mean. Yeah, I, I know what you mean, but we don't do that. There's no reason to meet. We Together, as a family, we determine the Lord's direction and then go. Be at peace among yourselves. You don't find sheep fighting each other or butting one another. Goats do that. You see them fight. But sheep, there's a, there's a getting along as the Lord has purpose. And so he says, now we exhort you, brethren, warn them that are unruly. Who are the unruly ones but the ones who want to bring law and impose themselves and be the directors and managers of people's lives. I know that when I was up in Grand Rapids, Michigan, they called the elders the Domini. The Domini was the Lord. And they could show up at any point, at any time during the week, and walk through your house and open your fridge, and actually to a point where some of them had to open up their checkbooks and show what their balances were. All of these things. Uh, unruly. Those are the unruly. Those that want to preach standards rather than the standard, which is Christ. He says, comfort the feeble-minded. Support the weak. Be patient toward all. The man is an italic there. Who's he talking about but the Lord's sheep? That's who we are by nature. Feeble-minded. A feeble-minded person doesn't need somebody standing over them and beating them down. Or support the weak. Is there anybody that can identify with anything but being weak? I sit down and prepare each week as a weak vessel. That unless the Lord is pleased to fill it by his grace, I've got nothing. Be dry and be patient toward all. The word patient means understanding in the sense that I understand another's weakness. I understand another's feeble-mindedness because that's who I am. You've heard me speak of lepers and a leper's, leper's comment. They're not looking at each other's spots and commenting, well, you've got a whole lot more spots than I do. And here's what you need to do to get rid of your spots. We're all in this because we are lepers by nature. Patient torn off. I've actually seen some lepers that Members are, are torn, and they need someone to prepare their food. They need to prepare and put it on a plate, and, and their hands are all bandaged up. And there they are. That's how we are in our nature. And so see that none render evil for evil unto any man. But ever follow that which is good. And here's a good illustration again. When you see the word good, what is that? It's a derivative of the word God. Follow that which is of God. It concerns God and his attributes and glory. Both among yourselves and to all. That's talking even about reprobates out there. How do we deal with them But in how God has been pleased to deal with us unconditionally in his grace, mercy? We of all people should understand why even the unregenerate act as they do because such were some of you and so rejoice evermore if god has given us this true view of who we are in the lord jesus christ is there any reason not to rejoice i liken it to kids out playing all day they're not 
sitting there worried about whether or not there's going to be a meal at the house or whether or not they're going to have a place to sleep at night. You work hard to provide that for them so they're not worried. And they're playing and having a good time. This week I was sitting here preparing. I heard the voice of kids out playing. And I look out the office window and they're just down the street here playing tag, rolling this big ball and having a good time. And when it was time to go in for lunch, I heard someone call them. And next thing you know, whoop, they're in. And, and then a little while later, out they come again. Let's go play. That's how I view what it is for us to enjoy the grace of God in Christ Jesus. It's not a dutiful, tedious manner of living. Rejoice evermore. Pray without ceasing. Again, that doesn't mean bowing ahead, coming up with words, but it talks there about what's from the heart as the Spirit of God gives it. Ever looking to the hand of our Master. Praying, supplicating him, looking to him for direction. If any lack wisdom, let him ask of God who giveth what? Liberally. With all liberality. God doesn't play cat and mouse with any one of us. And that's what encourages us to pray without ceasing. I've had some tell me, well, if I believed in the kind of God you preach, then I wouldn't even pray. Well, my answer back to them is, if I believed in the kind of God you preach, there's no reason to pray because he can't do anything anyway. It's all up to you. You call on a God that cannot save unless you let him. You call upon a God that will not hear unless you cry and lift your voice loud enough. Now, pray without ceasing. In other words, this is a heart of worship continually before this God. And here's verse 18 now, so you can see the context. In everything, give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. What's difficult to understand about that statement right there? In light of everything else, who God is and who we are in the Lord Jesus Christ, it says, not in some things, but in everything, give thanks. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. You can, again, look at other passages of Scripture. I would encourage you to do that. Just take your concords and look up the word thanks, thanksgiving. You'll see, as someone pointed out, there are over 138 passages of Scriptures where this is the exhortation. In Colossians chapter 3 and verse 17, You'd like to look there, Colossians chapter 3 and verse 17. We read this. And whatever you do in word or deed, kind of pause and think, oh boy, here it comes. But this isn't a legalism. Whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, from whom all blessings flow. And what? Giving thanks to God the Father. Through him. So I'm thinking about all the reasons to be thankful for who he is. How he is the advocate. When we sin. Not if we sin, but when we sin. How he is that righteousness before the Father. What part of our lives can you think of that would not be needful for us just to give thanks to God, whether in word or deed? And do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks, part of thanksgiving. In Philippians chapter 4, and verses 6 through 8, here again, why are we fretting? Why are we worrisome? Well, that's our sin nature. And this is why I believe every command of Scripture is there because it points out wherein we fail. But the purpose is to draw us to look to Christ, God through Christ. And here in Philippians 4, verse 6, be careful for nothing. That word simply means don't be fretting, don't be worrying for anything. It's like someone said, don't worry about nothing because nothing's going to be all right. Well, here it says be careful for nothing. And look at this, but in everything by prayer and supplication, Notice those two words. The word prayer means to ask. Supplication means to 
Ask is one in need who's hungry and thirsty. Who gives us that hunger and thirst but the Spirit of God? But look what follows. With thanksgiving, let your requests, and say demands, but let your requests be made known unto God. And in so doing, verse 7, the peace of God, which passes all understanding, all human understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. This is how God's purpose to keep our minds and our hearts, not just the head, but the heart. Through Christ Jesus, the very one who ever lives to intercede on behalf of those for whom he paid the debt. He's not going to lose one. And so in verse 8, when it says, finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, I don't want you to think here of a list now of do's and don'ts. When it says whatsoever things are true, stop and think about who is true. Who is the truth? It's Christ. He just said it in verse 7 that shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ. So every one of these attributes here in verse 8 pertains to Christ. Whatever is true, whatever pertains to Christ as the truth, what sort of things are honest? Some people say, well, I've never met an honest man. Well, that's true. Not among men, but there's one honest man, one who is trustworthy, and that's Christ. What sort of things are just? means to be right, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, don't be looking in here. Don't read this as a to-do list, like I gotta get working on these things so I can reflect it. No, it's not in you, it's in Christ. Whatever things are of good report. And there again, good means God's report. Whatever pertains to God's report. This is the record, John said, that God has given us of his son, that we might believe on him. All of this is Christwood. If there be any virtue, not in us, but in seeing all that virtue in Christ, and if there be any praise, that's what thanksgiving is, it's praise, think on these things, and those things which ye have both learned and received and heard. There's a witness right there. Learned and received and heard from whom? Who's the source? It's God, by his spirit, taught through this word, the gospel of Christ, and seen in me. In other words, Paul is saying, I'm not telling you anything different than what directs and guides my own life. Talk about a man that faced peril and, and distress, pursued from place to place, and yet in all this, he says, all that you have learned and received and heard and seen in me do, and the God of peace shall be with you. So this is what we find in scripture as far as giving thanks unto God. There's a hymn in our hymnal, and I thought about having a singer, but then I thought, well, this might be a little bit risky in the sense that we may not all know the tune that well, but it's it's in our hymn book. It's entitled, Now Thank We All Our God. And I've seen that hymn many times, and I know the tune of it, but what I didn't know was the story behind it. It was written by one Martin Rinkhart. And this was back, he lived between 1586 and 1649. And he was a minister in a little village of Eilenburg in Saxony, which is a region there in Germany. And he grew up as the son of a poor coppersmith. But he began his pastoral work just as the Thirty Years' War was raging through Germany. You can go back and look all this up in history. And it was a very difficult war. Thirty years. There were floods of refugees. We think that refugees is just something in modern era. It's been God shaking nations and moving people. And so there was a flood of refugees that streamed into, this was a walled city of Eilenburg back in the day. And it was the most desperate of times. The Swedish army, and that's where the war was between these of Germany and, and the Swedes, they, they encompassed the city gates and besieged it. And there was no food to be found, there were plagues, there were famines, there was, there was fear, 
fact, the story say 800 homes were destroyed and people began dying in increasing numbers. And here again, you look at this and you say, well, how can these things be? Just remember what we read in Psalm 95, all things are of God. And he directs all things, even such things as wars and famines and disease and death. Stop and think, well, who gives life? That's God. Well, then where does death originate? Well, it comes from God. That's his prerogative. But there were other ministers in that particular city at the time, and one by one, they began to die off. To where the only one left alive who was known as a minister back in the day was this Martin Reinhardt. And as is the case many times today, the minister was responsible to preside the funerals. And this man had as many as 50 funerals a day. But finally, the Swedes, they demanded a huge ransom from this city. If they were to be delivered, it was going to require a ransom. I find that interesting that, as Job said, deliver them, I've found a ransom. That's how God deals with his people. Ransom was found in the Lord Jesus Christ. But here, in this particular instance, it was this Martin Reinhardt who left the safety of the city at the time to go and negotiate with the enemy on behalf of the city. And he did it with the courage that God obviously gave him so that by the time he came back, the hostilities were ended in the, the period of suffering. And this Reinhardt, knowing that there's no healing and that even through all that he experienced, all of this was to be to the praise and glory and honor of God and to be done with thanksgiving. And so that's where he composed this hymn for the survivors of Eilenburg. And ever since this has been sung, Somewhat like in other parts of the world, it's been sung like we sing the doxology that we're accustomed to sing. But you can see the words in our hymn book there. You found them. Now thank we all our God with heart and hands and voices. Now just think, he's just gone through the most terrible period of time you can imagine. You say, well, what's to thank? Is what, what we're looking at his, here is what the scripture says. And everything give thanks. It's not just the good times us to thank him for his sovereign will being accomplished who wondrous things has done and whom his world rejoices who from our mother's arms has blessed us on our way with countless gifts of love and still is ours today that takes the grace of god to sing that oh may this bounteous god through all our life be near us with ever joyful hearts and blessed peace to cheer us to keep us in his grace Guide us when perplexed and free us from all ills of this world and the next. All praise and thanks to God, the Father now be given, the Son and Spirit blessed. Notice, who reign. Where's God in all of this? Well, he reigns. It's like Psalm 115 says, when the heathen ask, where now is your God? Our God is in the heavens, and he has done whatsoever he will. Who reign in highest heaven, the one eternal God, whom heaven and earth adore. For thus it was, is now, and shall be forevermore. A great, great hymn. So come back here to our text. Let me just sum this up with a few thoughts. First Thessalonians 5:18. First thing we find here in this scripture is the command to give thanks and it says in everything give thanks this is not a proposition this is not a proposal that god is laying out here it's a command in everything give thanks he said well, why give thanks in everything well because as romans 8 28 says we know that all things work together for good, and there we see the word good again, put the word God. They all work together for God, for his glory, whether you see the good in it or not. 
but it's to them that are the called according to his purpose. To them that love God, and the called according to his purpose. So that is a word directed to those that have been taught by the Spirit of God, by his grace. And I say this is an area where the Lord distinguishes his own from the rest of the world. We know our own nature. We know that the first thought is to complain and be angry and, and rebel and react in unbelief, such is our nature. But God, by his grace, then draws us back through those circumstances to see that even in those circumstances, no matter what they are, it doesn't just say in, in the good times, but in even what we consider times of affliction or oppression or opposition to give thanks in everything. So as God is pleased to teach us, even now, and I've often said, this is the lesson that we're having right now, and then comes the test. Where's the test? Through those doors. I dare say we're going to finish up tonight singing the hymn and thinking, wow, what a blessed time to be together. In these four walls, it's a, it's a little oasis for us, but as soon as we go through that door, we're back out into the world. But may the Lord grant us this grace to remember that in everything, give thanks. In Ecclesiastes chapter 7, verse 14, here's why we give thanks. It's because God ordains adversity as well as prosperity. I know I've had people after hearing a message such as this, they'll say, oh, yes, but you just don't understand. You just don't understand. I had a person this past week kept repeating that. When I would say, well, I understand. No, you don't. You haven't been through what I've been through. You don't know. Well, all I know is that God custom makes every one of our trials. They're custom made. They're by his hand. Normally you think of having a suit custom made and it's for your comfort. Well, this is for God's glory. It doesn't matter whether we feel comfortable or not. God is accomplishing his purpose. And here in Ecclesiastes 7, 14, this is, again, look at verse 13. Consider the word of God, for who can make that straight which he had, he had made crooked? All your fussing and turning, that's not going to make that crooked stick straight. Why? And, and so here it is in verse 14. In the day of prosperity, be joyful. Think about even as undeserving sinners, how much we're blessed for the most part in our lives, even as fallen creatures, to enjoy the blessings of this life, temporal, but even more so spiritually. So in the day of prosperity, be joyful. Rejoice. But notice, in the day of adversity, consider, ah, this is what God's doing then. He's bringing us to consider who? Him. Because it says, God also has set the one over against the other. So this is God directing, according to his will, to the end that man should find nothing after him. Imagine that. God does it, as he said, don't. Fret not yourself for tomorrow. Sufficient on the day is the evil of that. But all these things God purposes in order to show us the vanity of this life. Verse 15, all things have I seen in the days of my vanity. You're not going to change. There's a just man that perisheth in his righteousness. As men deem righteous. They say, oh, I was a good man, but the Lord takes him out early. And there's a wicked man that prolongs his life in his wickedness. We sit and puzzle with that and think, well, God should have taken it. No, every time you say God should have, that means that you're judging things as if you were the judge. We're, we're acted upon. I see myself as nothing but a pawn on God's chessboard where he is moving these different chess pieces to his purpose and glory, to the end that man be checkmated, and that God receive all the glory. So that's why we give thanks. He ordains adversity as well as prosperity. Here again, people have a view of the world as if there's a tug of war between God and 
Satan, and we got to get on God's side and help him win this battle. No. We move and live and have our being as he purposes. Every circumstance, when it says here in 1 Thessalonians 5.18, and I know I'm dwelling on these words because we read it quickly. It's in everything, in everything, every circumstance that comes our way is from God. We don't know one second from now what God has purpose for our life. I don't. We make plans. But it is God that determines what is and what isn't. We don't know, but we can look back. And I don't care what the pitfall, I don't care what the adversity, I don't care what the trial, all these things that you harbor still in your heart over the past. Think about how many people we talk to are still angry and upset and unsettled because of the past. You can't make straight what God, what God has made for us. That's, that's the part where you can churn all you want to, but it doesn't change who God is. It doesn't change what your circumstances are. In everything, give thanks. It's only a depraved, rebellious heart, and that's what we have. So when we resist, and that's why the sheep need the rod and the staff. <laughs> The rod that smack them, the staff that pull them back. That's Christ doing that. But in every circumstance, that resistance and re rebellion is really rebellion against God and how his hand is directed. We give thanks and everything because it's God that orders all things. And it comes by his sovereign. If you've ever learned that word permissive will, get rid of it. It's not in the Bible. If God permitted, he decreed it. People try to get around that. Well, it's not really God's will, but he permitted it. No. If it happened, it was God's will. In Job chapter 1 and verse 22, and I know I have to move on here. But in Job chapter 1 and verse 22. This is what Job learned. And he was brought to the lowest possible state of being in this flesh. It says that, verse 20, Job arose and rent his mantle. And shaved his head. That's a sign of mourning in that culture. And fell down upon the ground and what? Worshipped. Wait a minute. Worshipped? Yes, worshipped. Even there, the Lord had given him that spirit. It says that Job arose, rent his mantle. Yes, we, we weep. There's a mourning. But there's a bow in worship. It said, naked came I out of my mother's womb. And naked shall I return thither. The Lord gave, and what? The Lord hath taken away. That involves not only just material things, but actually the death of his children. What do you have to say about that, Job? We're talking here about the death of your children. Blessed be the name of the Lord. If you want a simple answer to whatever takes place in your life or mine, Blessed be the name of the Lord. That's a good place to begin. That's a good place to end. In all this, Job sinned not. Notice, nor charge God foolishly. Whenever we take God to task in our minds or hearts and question why, what we're doing is charging God foolishly. But what does it say? Blessed be the name of the Lord. I've told you before about that preacher that time some contrary thing took place he would say God is sovereign and we'll be thankful and a lot of people thought it was just a slogan but one day he was riding with a friend in a vehicle and the vehicle turned over and broke his ribs and by the time he crawled out of the vehicle he was just laying there and of course the driver was very concerned for him went over and looked at him and he said are you okay said, God is sovereign, and we'll be thankful. How about that being the answer? Blessed be the name of the Lord. And then shut your mouth. Shut your mouth. Because anything else that you have to say is only going to attribute to God foolishness. And that's, you know, for that alone, God should cast us into hell. The only reason he doesn't is because Christ paid the debt. You notice, it doesn't say there in everything, 
or for everything give thanks. Isn't that interesting? You can't necessarily thank him for certain things that take place, but in it, through it, after it, give thanks. That's the command. But secondly, you see here the manner of giving thanks. So it's not just gritting your teeth and say, all right, I'll give you thanks. Now the manner here is what? It says there in 1 Thessalonians 5, 18, and everything give thanks for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. So the manner of giving thanks, that is to God the Father, is always in the name of Jesus Christ. Is he the mediator or is he? Is he the advocate or is he? There, is there any time when he is not there to intercede on behalf of his own? That's why Paul wrote to the Ephesians there in Ephesians 5.20. He said, giving thanks always for all things. It's even stronger than what we're reading here in 1 Thessalonians 5.18. In everything, you want to know a definition? That means in always in all things to God the Father, but don't leave off that last part in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Think about what he saw. Is that not enough to stop our mouths? What he endured, who was the just, and yet for the unjust, endured these things. How could I ever say anything? We give thanks always for all things, even when the police call and tell you that your child's in jail. Or worse yet, dead. What do you say? Blessed be the name of the Lord. Doesn't mean we don't cry. Doesn't mean we don't mourn as Job did, but stood up and shaved his head and rent his garments. And yet, in all of that, when he bowed, he worshiped. It's difficult to give thanks for that. But in that, that's what the Spirit of God does. We're easily unsettled in our spirit and flesh. But thank God he never leaves us alone. We, we have a lot to learn even from Eli. Remember when the Lord spoke through that young man Samuel? And when Eli realized it was the Lord, Eli told him, don't hold back a thing. Whatever the Lord tells you, you tell me. But what was Samuel given of the Lord to tell Eli? That his sons would be killed. Okay? And the ark of the covenant would be taken into captivity. He was more concerned about the ark than even his own children because he knew his children deserved nothing better. But when Samuel told him everything and hid nothing from him, remember Eli's answer. It's just like with Job, blessed be the name of the Lord. With Eli, he said, it is the Lord. Let him do what seems good. Again, if you wonder, well, what do you, how do you respond? What do you say in those times? Because here, this is the manner of giving thanks. Thanks is, is to be given to him for all things, whether temporal things. Stop and think about all that we enjoy and all the evil he preserves us from. It could be, and yet never realize it. The food, the raiment. These are all mercies of life. Give thanks, but above all, even spiritual things. All of his grace. Just even now, I think about these moments when we can come aside and just enjoy moments of quiet to hear this word before we go back out there and face the world. All the spiritual blessings. It's like in Ephesians 1. It talks about being elect by God the Father, redeemed by God. His son regenerated, adopted, pardoned, justified, persevering grace, preserving grace. These are all blessings that are freely given for which we give thanks unto the Lord. So the manner for giving thanks is always in by and through the Lord Jesus Christ. There's another hymn we're going to sing here in a little bit. It's on our hymn books. How firm a foundation, ye saints of the Lord is laid for your faith in his excellent word, that word being Christ. What more can he say than to you he has said, to you who for refuge 
after Jesus said, "Flood." You think about refugees. That that's where we run. Were there not the distresses and the wars and the famines, we would get a little bit presumptuous and settled. So the Lord continues to unsettle and drive his sheep ever to Christ, the shepherd. There's a verse in the original of that hymn that's not in our hymn book. It would be good for it there, but it says, E'en down to old age, all my people shall prove my sovereign eternal unchangeable love and when hoary hairs shall their temples adorn like lambs they shall still in my bosom be born aren't you thankful the lord never let sits down one of the sheep or pats it on the rear end and says now behave yourself he is always carrying his sheep so that's the manner by which we thank him thirdly what's the purpose of giving thanks it says, for this is the will of God. Now, again, when you see the will of God there, it's not talking about a wish of God. He wishes. This is his will. And he will bring us to thank him. That will is that ever perfect, acceptable will of his that is well pleasing to sight and grateful to him. He's going to get the glory. And everything's going to turn out exactly as he has purposed. The final point here, because our time is gone, and there again, the means of giving thanks. It is in Christ Jesus concerning you. That's how the whole will of God is manifest. It's not about us, it's about his son. It's about what he's purposed to do to save sinners such as we are. And because we know that all that God does is in, by, and to the glory of his son alone, then thank you. It says in Christ concerning you. That is which he wills of you by Jesus Christ. His will will be accomplished. And so as he teaches us by his grace, so we give him thanks. Let's take our hymn books and sing that hymn 268. How firm a foundation. I'll sing this and then be dismissed. about these words, Christ being the foundation. How firm a foundation, ye saints of the Lord, is laid for your faith in his excellent word. What more can he say than to you he has said? To you, who for refuge to Jesus have fled, fear not, I am with thee, O oh, be not dismayed, for I am thy God, I will still give thee aid. I'll strengthen thee, help thee, and cause thee to stand upheld by my gracious, omnipotent hand. When through the deep waters I call thee to go, the rivers of woe, shall not be overflow for i will be with thee thy troubles to bless and sanctify to thee thy deepest distress when through fiery trials thy pathway shall lie my grace all sufficient shall be thy supply. The flame shall not hurt thee, I only design thy dross to consume and thy gold to refine. The soul that on Jesus hath leaned for repose 
I will not, I will not desert to his foes. That soul, though of hell, should endeavor to shake. I'll never, no, never, no, never forsake. That's what it means to make a joyful noise unto the Lord. That's a victory song right there. Amen. All right. We'll see you next time as the Lord directs.